So what I'd like to do is imagine, is to do a little role playing here. Imagine that I'm a principal and I want to raise this issue and have a crucial conversation with staff members about the use of zero. As I do this, I'm gonna to try to honor the person. I'm gonna to try to seek to understand by encouraging that person to explain her assumptions. I'm going to see if we can't find some common ground. I'm going to share my assumptions and thought processes. And very importantly, I'm gonna build shared knowledge. Patterson says the prerequisite homework for a crucial conversation is gathering facts. So would you join me in welcoming my reticent, recalcitrant uh, teacher, uh, the beautiful and talented Becky Dufour. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. You know, Becky, you're aware of the fact that I've been meeting with the faculty in small groups and we've been having conversations and I've been challenging people to rethink some of our assumptions about grading and homework policies and some of the things that don't really seem to align with our purpose of helping all kids learn. And I know that you've been particularly vocal about um, and critical of those conversations. And so I know you're a really dedicated teacher who cares deeply about her kids and works very, very hard. And I wanted to come together and see if we could have a conversation and come to a better understanding of our respective positions and see if we couldn't find some common ground. Okay. Does that sound all right? That's fine, yes. Let, let's start with why is it that you give homework in, in the first place? Let's just zero in on homework for a minute. Well, you know, I, I'm a student of the research, as you know, and the research tells us that if we give kids homework, it gives them the opportunity to practice. And if they practice, we can give them feedback, and ultimately that's going to help them learn. So I've always been a big believer in giving kids homework so that I can give them feedback. Great. So we found common ground already. I agree that there is evidence that the practice and feedback that homework uh, can, can allow is one way to improve student learning. So let me ask you this question. If the reason you're giving the homework assignment in the first place is because you believe it's vital and essential to the student's learning, then why would you let the student opt out of doing the work? Why would you say, um, because you didn't turn it in on time, I'm just going to give you a zero? Well, you know, I, if kids don't turn their work in on time and they don't get a, a zero, then it's just enabling them. And so I set the consequence that you must turn your work in on time and if you don't, you get a zero. Because I'm not just an English teacher here. I'm teaching kids skills for life. And in life, there are deadlines, and we've got to prepare them for the real world out there. Well, I, again, I think we can find some common ground there. Um, I agree that in, in life, there are deadlines. And I agree that there are consequences in life when we fail to meet our deadlines. But let me extend that uh, a little further. You know. I've faced a lot of deadlines as a principal, and I'm not proud to admit this, I haven't always met them. Uh, there was a time just last year where I failed to turn in the staffing recommendations on time. You know, the superintendent wanted them by a certain date, I didn't turn them in, and there was a consequence. He called me up, he chewed me out, he sent an angry email, it showed up in my evaluation, and I think it impacted my raise. So there was a consequence, but you know what my consequence has never ever been when I failed to meet a deadline? Never has the superintendent, superintendent said to me, then never mind, don't do the work. I still have to do it. I still had to turn in those staffing recommendations. The IRS has some pretty serious notions about deadlines, as you know. <laughs> and, and what could be more real world than the IRS? And you know, they actually watch the sweep of the second hand. They want to make sure that you turn your taxes in on time. And if you don't turn them in on time, there are consequences, right? But the consequences never, never mind, we don't want your taxes. I mean. You, you still have to do the work and turn in your taxes. Here as a school, we've set deadlines for our faculties. You know, just last grading period, I said, turn in your grades by noon on Friday. And just like every time I say that, some teacher doesn't turn in their grades by noon on Friday. In fact, you didn't turn in your grades <laughs> by noon on Friday. But as you recall, Becky, I didn't say, well, never mind, I don't want your grades. I mean, I would contend that in the real world, Failure to do your work on time rarely exonerates you from doing the work. There are consequences, but the consequence isn't don't do the work, you still have to do it. But, but let, let's just move on here and, and see if we can't find, again, some, some common ground. Would you agree that one of your goals is that you are trying to teach your kids and you want your kids to learn to be responsible? Yes, absolutely. Would you also agree that, you know, 
some of the kids who come to us as 14 year olds aren't responsible. I can absolutely agree with that. I can, I can name the kids in my classes right now that, that fit that description. So you want to know who they are? I have a pretty good idea. Uh, okay. All right. Can you agree then that if you give a major assignment like you're prone to do in your English class with major papers do, can you agree that the responsible kids will probably do the work and turn in that paper? Yeah. And that do. irresponsible kids, if you give them the choice, either do this work or take a zero? Do you agree that there are some kids who would just as soon take the zero? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We know that to be true, Every right? year, every year. So how yeah. is it that allowing a kid to be irresponsible, to not do the work, teaches the kid to be responsible? Doesn't that seem counterintuitive to us? Let, let me suggest an analogy here. Okay. Uh, you're a parent. I don't think you would ever say to your 14-year-old child, look, I want you to have that lawn mowed by noon on Saturday. And if you don't have it mowed by noon on Saturday, you'll never have to mow it. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think that that's you know, how, how you would deal with your own child. And our relationship with kids is in loco parentis. We're supposed to be in place of the parent. So if that's not what you would do with your own kid, why are you doing it with other people's I, kids? Rick, I think that's a false analogy. I mean, in, in that story there, there is no consequence. And that's the total exact opposite of what I'm saying. When kids don't do the work in my class and turn it in on time, they get a consequence, a zero. You don't have a consequence in that analogy. Well, that's, that's, you're right. That's a valid point. I don't have a consequence. But what I'm suggesting is that the zero that you give as a consequence is of no consequence to the student. So let me extend the analogy. You tell your kid, I want the lawn mowed by noon on Friday. They don't mow it by noon on Friday. And you say to them, because you failed to meet that deadline, you don't get to go with us to grandma's house this weekend. You're not going to take that four-hour drive. You're going to have to stay home all alone and unsupervised. <laughs> and when you get back, the police are there. Turns out your kid's throwing a party. There's underage drinking. The neighbors have complained about the, the noise. And, and you tell the police, officer, I had no idea this was going to happen. I thought my son would go up to his room and rue the day that he had failed to meet a deadline and would vow to be more, more punctual in, in, the, in the future. I had no idea this is how he'd respond. If you got a really benevolent police officer, he might say, look, you seem a little naive, lady, but I'm going to cut you some slack here. You know, do better. If the very next month you did the exact same thing, gave him the consequence, you're going to have to stay home alone, you went to grandma's, he threw another party, the police wouldn't cut you any slack. They would say, you have been negligent. You know better, based on experience. You have contributed to the delinquency of this child. And so there will be a consequence, and now it's going to be for you. I would contend that they would do that after two events. We have 100 years of history that telling a kid, either do your work or take a zero, does not encourage all kids to do the work. So here's my assertion, Beck, and, and this is my thought process. Help me you know, identify the mistakes I'm making in my thought process. I'm operating under this assumption. If we allow students the option of acting irresponsibly, if we give them that choice, many will take it. I'm arguing that allowing students to choose to be irresponsible doesn't teach them responsibility, and that if we want our kids to be responsible, we're going to have to change some of our adult practices and begin to respond to them in different ways. That's my argument. What, where do you see the flaw in that? Mm. I just think you and I have different philosophies on this. Well, that's true. I think we do have different philosophies, but I don't think we should be making decisions in this school based on our philosophies or opinions. I think we should be making them based on evidence. So I've done some homework. Let me suggest the evidence to you. Here's what we know about high school kids in the United States, last year 1.23 million of them dropped out. That's one kid dropping out of high school every 26 seconds in this country. And that means for every entering freshman class, 30% of the kids did not finish high school. Now, based on that evidence alone, doesn't that suggest to you that we need to change our adult practices? But you're just focused on the 30% there. What about the 70% we have been successful with? Shouldn't we be celebrating that? I mean, for example, my husband and I play doubles tennis a lot. I heard he's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you must have been talking to him, right? <laughs> well, um, 
Anyway, we do play doubles tennis a lot, and I can assure you if we won 70% of our matches, we would be thrilled. So, you know, again, I, I think it's wrong to focus on the 30%. I think we're doing a really good job. Well, I have a couple problems with that. First, I think there's a lot more at stake here than a game, so let me suggest. <laughs> Yeah, but you don't really know my husband, do you? <laughs> He's pretty competitive, let me tell you. You want to stick, stick to the script here? Oh, okay. um, <laughs> Sorry, Rick. Let's look at some uh, right. facts regarding those kids who drop out of high school. Um, here's what we know to be true. These are just hard facts. We know that for uh, the kid who drops out of high school, they're going to earn 33 cents for every dollar that a college graduate makes. They're going to earn... 66 cents for every dollar that a high school graduate makes. They're going to be more prone to ill health and they're going to live a shorter life. We can predict that a high school dropout is going to live 10 fewer years than a college graduate. We know that they're less employable in a volatile job market. They're not going to be able to provide for themselves or their families. And worst of all, their own child is only going to have a 1 in 17 chance of ever being a college graduate. So there is a lot at stake here, literally life and death issues at stake. There's a lot more than a game here. And I also disagree with your assumption that we're being successful for the 70%. Here's some data from the ACT based on their survey last year. They said if there's 100 kids who enter high school in the United States, 30 of them are going to drop out before they graduate. Of the kids who enter college, 30 of them are going to drop out, most of them within the first year of college. Only 23 of them are going to end up in the workforce, Tw uh, 12 of them uh, are going to be college uh, graduates within five years of entering. They'll earn their bachelor's degree, and only five are going to earn an associate's degree. So of those 100 kids who entered college, only 17 of them are going to end up with a degree within five years. And President Obama has said that uh, having some education beyond high school, post-high school education, is an absolute prerequisite for success in this country today. Now, it's not just the ACT who says this. Let's look at the College Board. They've taken uh, some statistics and studies. Whoops, here we go. They said, um, if the, you can imagine that a, there are about 4,000 kids entering a school in the United States, if it's a typical school reflecting the national tendencies, if they enter as ninth graders, that cohort group will only have 2,800 kids left by the time they start school as seniors. And of that group, only 725 will earn a college degree within four years after they've graduated from high school. So there are very few industries or organizations that would look at a line like that and say, well, aren't we being successful? I think it demands that we begin to look for other ways. Here's another evidence of our success. Throughout the 20th century, we rank first in the world in terms of high school graduation rates. Today, we rank 21st out of 27 advanced economies. We rank dead last in terms of the percentage of kids who enter college and who actually graduate from college. Not only do we have a high, a high high school dropout rate, we've got a terrible college dropout rate. And when I was in college, my age group, or when I was entering the profession, when we were 25 to 34, we ranked first in the world in terms of the percentage of us who were college graduates. When you were in that age group in 1995, we dropped to second. Today, we, we rank 11th in the world in terms of the percentage of people in that age group being college graduates. To me, that suggests we, it demands that we begin to look at doing things differently. Don't you agree? Well, I, I, I do think your evidence is compelling, but what I would want is evidence that there's a better way. I well, mean, I'm working really, is. really hard. I'm I'd... so glad you asked that question because <laughs> there is evidence. Carrie yeah. Patterson has studied this, this, how do you get people to change their mind and how do you get them to change their behavior? And certainly that's a challenge for us. How do we get an irresponsible kid to change his behavior? And Patterson says, well, first you have to identify what's the absolutely vital behaviors that are critical to the person's success. And certainly completing their work is vital to a student's success in, in high school. And then he says, you don't just hope that they have those behaviors, you coach them. You make sure that they uh, are practicing those behaviors. You put in your structures and your incentives to monitor them. You give them rewards for the behaviors or respond when they don't. So yeah, there is a better way. Letting them opt out is not the best way. The couple of researchers from the University of Chicago says you have to anticipate that people are going to make bad decisions and you need to nudge them in the direction of making better decisions. You need to 
purposefully and systematically get them to change their behavior. And they say one way to do that is to think of your default position. Your default position is what happens when people make bad decisions. So for example, there is a deadline that our business office puts forth every year and says everybody needs to turn in their insurance uh, elections for next year by May 1st. So you need to let us know, do you want HMO, PPO, do you want the dental, do you want vision, you want family, you want single. So every year this goes out to our teachers and every year teachers fail to meet that deadline. Now I suppose our personnel office could say, well, you know, there should be consequences in the real world when people don't meet their deadlines, so we're not going to insure you next year. You and your family are going to be without insurance. I think that would uh, create a, a cry, a, a hue and cry from the faculty, because they would argue that's punitive, that the consequence goes way beyond the honest mistake of missing a deadline. You're putting people at risk if they don't have insurance. So we don't put them at risk. We say, OK, you're going to have the same insurance next year that you had this year, uh, meet your deadline next year. I'm arguing that by giving a kid a zero, we're putting that kid at risk. So our default position shouldn't be, now I'm giving you a zero. Our default position should be, now we're going to make you do what responsible people do. We will make you do the work. But Rick, I, you know I'm teaching five section, sections of freshman English. Look at all the kids I teach each and every day. There's no way I can track down all those kids who missed the deadline, give them second chances. There's no way I can do that. And I totally agree with you on that. And once again, I think we found common ground here. I'm not asking you to do that. What I'm asking you to do is to contribute to a school-wide system. All you're going to need to do is let us know who are the kids who aren't doing their work and who aren't passing your class, and then the school is going to respond. And I'll take responsibility for working with the staff to create the system that gets those kids into intervention and makes them do their work. I don't want this to be on your back, Becky. I want it to be a collective effort. But don't, aren't you willing to at least contribute that much to this collective effort? OK, I'll give it a try. Oh, you're the best. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Let's hear it for Becky. Harassment in the workplace, right? <laughs> Thanks, Rick. All right.